Welcome to Investor in the Family Radio, a podcast about learning to invest. My name is Brian Bain, and I'm your host. At Investor in the Family Radio, we believe that every dollar and minute we spend is an investment in something, and together, we want to make the best investments that we can, so thank you so much for joining us. On today's show, we have David Trainer, and amidst lots of great insights, there are two big things I'm especially excited to share with you. First is David's process for creating some of the best risk-reward scenarios possible, and second, how we as self-directed investors can best evaluate company management teams. And the last point is one I talk about on the show a lot, and David gives probably one of the best answers I've heard to date, so I'm excited to share that with you as well. Remember, our goal here is to help you learn to invest, and that's financially and in all of life. You can always find more at InvestorInTheFamily.com. The average self-directed investor earns annual returns of around 2.9%. Yikes, that's right, 2.9%. One of our goals here is to help change that. And two things that I believe will help are conviction and discipline. And I've created a simple resource to help with both. I like to call it the purchase filter. It's a simple 10-step checklist designed to help prevent you and me from making bad and emotional investments. This really could be a game changer for many of us, including myself. If you want this resource, actually I should say this new and updated resource, simply text the word FILTER to the number 44222 or sign up over at investorinthefamily.com and we'll make sure to get you the purchase filter. Are you an avid listener of Investor in the Family Radio and looking for ways to support the show? We have great news. You can now support the show free every time you shop at Amazon. All you have to do instead of going directly to amazon.com is go to investorinthefamily.com slash Amazon and you'll be redirected to the Amazon site and everything will be business as usual except a small percentage of each sale will come back to Invest in the Family with no extra cost to you. So thanks in advance for your support and hope you enjoyed today's interview with David Trainer. Well, hey, David, welcome to the show. Thanks for having me, Brian. Hey, it's an honor to have you here with us. I'd love if we got started, if you don't mind giving our audience a little bit of background on yourself as an investor and then what you're doing now investing-wise. Sure. So, you know, I got started in the business in the, in the mid-90s as an auditor and then moved quickly into executive compensation consulting. And I remember the big aha moment in terms of being in the real world versus being in school was that, you know, the numbers they tell you to use in looking at stocks academically and even on Wall Street are not really the numbers. When you're talking about boards of directors who really care about investment, making sure that executives are properly aligned with investors. There's a whole new set of numbers, and they're not the numbers you see in income statements or in the numbers you see in press releases. And then I went to Wall Street to take that knowledge that I'd gotten from, from the, the accounting firm and the executive compensation and apply that across the entire equity research department for Credit Suisse. Back in the day, before the tech bubble, when people really cared about research. And, um, and I built a really <laughs> successful sort of business within the equity research department around doing that, Brian. Um, and then the tech bubble came and nobody cared about numbers. I mean, our morning call meetings went from talking about cash flow and the expectations for future cash flow baked in the stock prices. We were, you know, we regressed back to PEs. Then it went to price to revenue. Then it went to price to clicks. Then it went to price to eyeballs. And everyone was just like laughing at that point. Like, oh, whatever, we're making $3 billion on this thing tomorrow. It doesn't matter what it is. We're making $3 billion. Right. <laughs> And, and so um, after that experience, uh, I really started thinking about uh, how to automate part of the process for getting to the clean numbers. Because the, the trick uh, in terms of getting the real numbers, it's not really a trick. The, the challenge is that it's really hard. You have to read like an annual report, and those are on average like 200 pages long. Some of them are 2,000 pages. And if you don't go through every page, you don't know what you don't know. Hmm. And what I found is that, you know, even amongst some of the largest money managers in the world, where before the, the, the tech bubble, people cared about this stuff. After the tech bubble and with the advent of CNBC and all the sort of fast money, fast paced stuff, and, and the, I think the impact of a lot of the self directed trading firms. Nobody cares about footnotes. Nobody cares about cash flows. You don't need to. The technical screens have worked. Technical tools have worked extremely well for the last 15 years. What we're finding today, however, though, as we're closer to the end of the bull market, closer to the end of zero interest rate policy than we are to the beginning, you know, the market's more in a trading range, and technical tools aren't working anymore. Relative strength for about eight years was awesome, worked perfectly. 
last eight months, broken down. So we think fundamentals are going to matter again. And, and so that's kind of my background. I care about fundamentals. I built technology around getting to the true fundamentals. And, and that's what we focus on. And when you say we, who, who are you referring to? I'm talking about new constructs, my firm. Right. Right. right? And, and, and uh, you know, we have marketing and distribution relationships with um, big firms like Thomson Reuters and Scott Trade Interactive Brokers. So you, get our, you can get our stuff through those sites uh, at a pretty big, pretty, pretty big discount. Um, but mainly I'm talking about the, the analysts and, and engineers that we have at New Constructs. And what we do here that's, that's really unique is, is we, you know, I built technology starting about a dozen years ago. That basically said, I, need, I, want to, I want to create a machine environment or, 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 or a machine learning environment that's going to track what an expert analyst does. Because what I hated about building models was that I'd, you know, I'd go through the 10K, I'd type it into Excel, and all the work that I'd done to figure out the numbers that I typed into my model was forgotten as soon as I moved on to the next filing or to another task. Right. There was no link between what I took from that paper filing or even a digital filing and the model. And it created some real conflicts in analytical integrity. Like, for example, you know, if we, at, when I was at Credit Suisse and we were doing those manually, if someone figured out that, you know, or we figured out that we were doing something wrong and we needed to treat a certain accounting thing in a different way, it required us to go back through 500, 1,500 models, manually go back to the, to the annual report and, and, and like, pull out. And, and, and for every year in each one of those 500 or 1,000 models, find the find the thing in the annual report that we needed to find that needed to be changed, put the number in a different spot. I mean, you weren't going to do it. It's too much work. Sure. And so the machine learning environment integrated the, the actual a digital version of the filing, and it tracked exactly what the analysts were doing. Analysts weren't typing every, anything in. They were sort of selecting a piece of, of, of text or, or numerical string from a filing, putting it into a bucket, right? And so the machine could track... You know, not just what the name of the line item was and the value, but also the location within the filing and then the type of data point. Was it in a table or was it in text? And so, and, and when we created that tool set, it allowed for us to create a lot of automatic data checking and it also made the process of going through the filings a lot smarter or a lot faster, a lot faster. So in my understanding, so basically so, as an analyst is going through the documents, they've got this technology, it's, not necessarily for notation purposes, but it's allowing them to be able to, again, track what they're looking at, what's important, and so when you come back later on, you can know you can basically pick up where you left off. Is that kind of the idea? Yeah, and the machine, you know, the machine is also pre-screening the entire, like pre-parsing the entire filing and identifying hmm. all the things that we've ever identified as a red flag or as a potential line item, right? And so it's going through the filing and telling, you, telling the analyst all the parts it needs to focus on. Because part of the deal with going through a 2,000-page or a 500-page filing yeah. is figuring out what you need to pay attention to and not pay attention to. Sure. So the technology does that. And then when they, when they parse something into the database, right, when they say, hey, this should go into current assets, this is, a, this is, this is a, um, prepaid expenses, this is accounts receivable, this is properly patent equipment, net of equipment, here's a cum- – I'm sorry, net of accumulated depreciation – Here's accumulated depreciation. When it's doing that, the system is remembering exactly, you know, it's, it's, it's connected to that place in the filing where the data was uh, taken from the filing. Right. And so if we decide we want, to, we, we want to change the treatment of property, plant, and equipment, and we want to make it a non-operating asset as opposed to an operating asset, which we would never do, but just for purposes of explanation here, we could, with a few keystrokes, tell the system for, you know, 80,000 filings that we've been through to make that change. We could automatically say, hey, we want to, we want to take the, the data that's in this bucket and change it from being an operating fixed asset to a non-op, non-operating fixed asset. And so, you, so you're not having to go back and manually touch all those individual filings well, and, and, and find so, the and so area. Then, and then the machine would then update that information and how it affects other aspects of the balance sheet throughout all of the work. Exactly. Wow. And, and, so we're not just and we're not just collecting data, Brian. We're like building really sophisticated models because right. my job when I was at Credit Suisse was to build the best earnings quality and valuation model in the world, and I believe we did that. And, and the problem, you know, and, and the cool thing about what we've done when you put in technology, right? We make that change for for fixed assets, and it automatically matriculates 
through every single year and every single model. You know, we cover 3,000 stocks right now. And so when you're talking about creating a model, again, you're, that's basically like, like pr- earnings projections and then future projections for what you expect to happen for any particular company, correct? Sure. I'll, I'll explain the model. There's, there's, sort of, there's two parts. One Great. part is understanding the historical performance. And there, what we do is we sort of translate all the accounting data into economic information. And what that means is that, you know, most, most, most sophisticated investors and most investors know that accounting earnings were not originally designed for equity investors. They're not really a a reliable number. Pro forma earnings, even worse, right? Mm -hmm. So what you have to do is, is you have to look at the income statement, balance sheet, cash flow statement, and the notes and take all of that information together to get to how much cash will the business generated and how much capital has been in the business, been put into the business over its life. It's another way of looking at cash on cash returns. You know, it's the same way you look at your financial advisor or, or a money manager. You don't care just about how much money they make you or the numerator. You also care about the denominator, how much capital you've given them. If a money manager makes you 10000 bucks and you've given him $10 million, that's not so good. If he makes you 10000 bucks and you've given him 50000 that's good. And so we're looking to get that number and the numerator exactly right, which we call NOPAT, or Net Operating Profit After Tax. And, we're, and we do a lot of work to get the denominator exactly right, which is called invested capital. And that, those numbers allow us to calculate return on invested capital, economic earnings or economic profit or EVA or CFROI or whatever you want to call it, as, as well as free cash flow. And so we do that for you know, history going back to 1998 or whenever a company first started providing um, their filings in digital form. That's the historical portion. And then the other part is va- the other part of the model is valuation. You know, when it comes to valuation, so once we've established what the historical cash flows have been, our approach to valuation is to figure out what kind of future cash flows are required to justify the current stock price. So it's important to point out, I'm not like pretending to be a fortune teller. What I tell all my analysts when we're trading them is that it's much easier to be a critic of the fortune teller than a fortune teller. And fortunately for us in the investing business, Mr. Market is, has to be a fortune teller every day, every minute of every day that the market is open. He's given us a price. And what we like to do is reverse engineer what kind of cash flows have to be achieved by the company to justify that price. Huh. And so the second part of our model looks at consensus expectations for, for cash flows as close as we can get to that number because our cash flow number is not typically what consensus consensus folks are looking at, but we try to get as good a proxy for that and model out sort of what the cash flow life cycle has to be in a discounted cash flow model to generate a stock price that's equal to the current market price. Hmm. And so what we'd like to do is identify stocks where the expectations are really high, right? And say, hey, we should sell or short those or identify stocks where the expectations for future cash flows are really low and say, hey, these are the ones we would want to be, you know, this, this is where you start to look for long ideas. High expectations is where you start to look for, you know, sell or short ideas. And it means that we're, you know, Brian, the takeaway is that we're, we're objective about this, right? I'm not here to sell religion. I'm not here to like take positions in stocks because we've got a beef. We're just very simply looking to identify companies where they're overstating their earnings and their valuations are super expensive where the expectations for future cash flows are super high. And then look at companies, you know, on the long side where maybe earnings understate cash flows and the expectations for future cash flows are relatively low. You know, it's, there's so many things I appreciate about what you're saying. First of all, I have an accounting background and I love it when I can tell I'm talking to someone with an accounting background because you know your numbers and you know the financial statements and the value or lack of value some of those may or may not have. So I, I love that. It's the language of business and I can tell you're speaking it and that's pretty, it's pretty fun to hear. And also the model you're describing, the fact that you have a model like you do, it just, it gets me excited because you, you have a very objective view on determining what you feel like the appropriate value of a stock is. You know, it's so easy to complicate. There's ton of this with all the information out there about any given company. There's so much you can look at. It can easily become overwhelming and that's totally justifiable to feel that way. But when you boil it down, you think about what a business is. You know, if I go out and I start a business, ultimately my success that business 
or whether or not that, that business is a success to me is how much cash is it bringing in, right? But when we think about Wall Street, we think about stocks and the stock market, you know, we think about appreciation and value. And, you know, some people may focus on dividends, obviously, but ultimately appreciation tends to be the name of the game for the broader number of at least self-directed investors out there for better or for worse. But ultimately, a company is successful if it's making money to the owners, um, for the owners. And that's what you're looking at. You're saying, are, is this company determining on what Mr. Market is valuing the company at right now? Is it realistic? And then you're, you know, looking at future cash flows. Is it overpriced? Is it underpriced? Man, I, I get, I just get excited when I hear about a very objective, um, no nonsense model for being able to make decisions about investments because it can get so objective and confusing and emotional so quick. Yeah, I really, I appreciate you saying that. And, and I think that, you know, for your listeners, you know, everything you see us write published in Forbes, CNBC, Wall Street Journal is built on. Uh, that kind of a model. And, you know, our, our service ultimately at the end of the day is just simply to help investors make a more informed decision because you're right. I mean, in this fast paced world, there's so much stuff going on. There's so much work to do. Nobody has time to do this work. And what is technology good for more than doing those things that humans don't have time to do or don't really want to do or not that good at? I've read more annual reports than I care to admit. And let me tell you, machines are better at it than I am because it's not fun. I'm not good at doing the same thing over and over. I'm not good at typing in operating lease, future minimum operating lease payment requirements over and over and over. I mean, I just don't want to do that. Machines should do that. And then when you're getting the good data, the model is kind of the same every time. And just like you said, it's sort of universal. It's about how much capital you put in the business, how much cash flow it makes, what the accounting jargon is you know, to, 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 for, for naming those economic activities should matter. You should transcend the accounting, understand the economics, and then, yeah, just build a model on top of that that says, okay, I'm going to reverse engineer the future cash flows to justify the price, and now I'm in a position to really make a more informed decision. You know, is the stock price, is Mr. Market projecting a, few, predicting a future that I think is unlikely or likely? Uh, and it's, it's something that investors don't need to use, but it certainly lowers their risk if they can have access to that kind of information. It's sort of like, well, why not pay attention to that? Yeah, it makes me thinking about, you know, the people listening to this show right now. And, you know, because you hear this, like, well, that sounds great for David because he has these models and he has the ability to um, have the machines go through the, the financial statements. Which, side note, I'm I'm very curious as far as how all that works. And, that you know, this podcast may not be the forum to get into all that. And I'm sure it, it's would take a lot more time than we have. But just like you said, you know, so many often the terminology and jargon for counting varies so much from statement to statement. And that the fact that that software can go through there and identify things accurately, pinpoint them, put them in the right place is a pretty fascinating piece of software machine that you guys have created. But for someone listening to this as a self-directed investor could think, like I said, great for them. What what, do you have any thoughts as far as how a self-directed investor who doesn't have access to that, how maybe they could approach with a similar philosophy and maybe be able to have some worthwhile results? Yeah, first thing I want to say is, is the machine doesn't figure out like which accounting line item or which accounting jargon thing, how it should be treated. The machine has been instructed by analysts who've done that work in the past for lots of filings, and it, it's based on how analysts have treated that, expert analysts that I've trained or that I've that, you know, or finds that I've parsed myself, right? Right. Um, and so it's not like machines figure stuff out. Machines only do what they're told. Of the course. Cool, the cool thing about what we have is that we've told a machine what to do across 70,000 filings. So we've seen where all the bodies are buried, so to speak. Right. Now, but to your, to, to your real question, you know, how, would it, how can an investor, a uh, self-directed investor, uh, implement these kinds, the same kind of approach? And, you know, look, it's, it's, it's what kind of the, the godfathers in the business have said over the years. You roll up your sleeves. You read the annual reports, you model the data, and 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 you and you, and you look at the, look at things the way we're looking at them. I mean, it's the, it's the traditional value investor approach. I look at my technology as applied value investing. Right, what I'm looking to do is is automate the parts of the value investing process that are not value add, collecting data, building models, so that our clients can make very you know, make the same kind of decisions as really sophisticated and value investors and focus their time on the hard questions as opposed to having to spend their time 
building models over and over and, and reading annual reports and collecting data over and over. At the beginning of the interview, you made a comment that the numbers that matter are different than what most people focus on, whether it be in press releases or financial statements. Can you mind fleshing that out a little bit more? Yeah, I mean, net income does not equal cash flow. Pro forma, you know, the way I, the, one of the, I, I, when I, I knew I, I the, the time when I really decided I need to go start my own firm was, you know, after Credit Suisse, I was at another firm and they were, um, we were having a conversation uh, or argument about whether or not, you know, using a PE multiple was as robust as using a discounted cash flow model. And a big part of it focused on whether or not earnings was a good number. And, you know, Google earnings management, Google quality of earnings, and you'll have a thousand articles telling you why you can't try to net income. Sure. But what really got me is, is that as soon as I kind of officially won that argument, and it went on for a long time about, you know, what you could, what, you, know, you couldn't do, you couldn't trust a PE, main, you know, if, if for no other reason than you couldn't trust the E. The next question was, <laughs> you know, what about price to revenue? And I was like, okay, um, I'm, I'm out. I'm not doing this, right? And the point, my point is, revenue is even farther away from net income or profit. Revenue is even farther away from real profits than net income is away from real profits. And in between net income and revenue, you've got pro forma earnings. And so you've know, you got to be really careful. Pro forma earnings are taking you farther away from the truth than they are getting you closer. And could you and flesh so, I could just tell us, when you say pro forma earnings, what do you mean by that? I'm talking about the numbers that management tends to be tends to focus on, okay, and tends to say, "Hey, look, don't pay attention to this reported net income number. Pay attention to this pro forma EBITDA." And uh, even though we've, <laughs> you know, even though 90% of our revenue growth over the past five years has come from acquisitions, our pro forma EBITDA excludes, of course, all acquisition related expenses, all merger costs, and all um, all stock based compensation. So um, measure our performance based on ignoring the cost of running the business, right? I mean, it's, it's a joke. And look, the SEC is looking into it. We've written a lot of articles on this. This is you know, for a lot of folks who um, look up pro forma earnings, and you'll see you know, a thousand articles telling you how sure. bad they are. Right. I guess that's another way to say it. Yeah, but but tends to be the place where I think a lot of self-directed investors focus because they – you know, the thing about doing it yourself, and you kind of referred to this already, that so many people are – it's too big. Like no individual working on the side can research a portfolio of stocks well and do that. Well. It's, just, it's not possible. Um, I mean, if someone's doing it well, I'd love to hear from you for an entire portfolio. But the reality is most people, you know, you cheat, you cut corners, you know, you borrow off an article from someone or someone else's research, which doesn't have to be bad as long as you're coming from a good source. But what I usually like to advocate is for people to take – if you're a self-directed guy doing this on the side, take 90% of your money and, and, and protect yourself from it and put it somewhere safe. And if you want to work with a small percentage of it, because maybe for one company or, or two companies or you know a handful, you know someone could dig in, really get their heels into the, the annual reports and the financials and the, the presentations and really see what's there and, 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 do, and do what you're doing and get beyond the pro forma, get beyond the PE numbers, and the, beyond the um, price to revenue, which is so easy to quote and so easy to jump off of. But really, the value is d hidden deep underneath that. And once you do that, then you can say, okay, I understand what's going on here as best you can. And then you can develop the conviction you need to make and actually put, to put money behind the investment and then have the discipline to hold on to the, that investment regardless of what Mr. Market may think about it in the meantime. And that's where I like to think as a any investor, but especially as a self-directed investor, that's where you want to get to. And I like the model you're describing and the philosophy is helping people to focus on what matters. You're exactly right. I mean, it's, it's, it's a little naive to believe that in your spare time on the weekends as a self-directed investor, you can compete with professionals who are spending 60 hours a week and several million dollars a year on research. It's kind of impossible, right? Right. And... And so uh, you, if you want to do it, you can do it maybe on a, on a couple or a handful of companies. The problem is that so much of investing is relative. So even if you know the return on capital for one company, it's hard to know how good it is, really, if you don't look at it compared to its peers. Sure. And that's 
that's part of why I knew technology was critical because when I first started doing this work on Wall Street, we had big clients, some of the top money managers in the world, and they'd say, David, this model is awesome. I love it. But I need it for the entire S&P 500 before it's valid because I need to be able to rank everything and know what's good and bad. Then I thought, oh, my God, how are we going to do that? And, <laughs> I need a bigger so, pencil. That's, yeah, exactly. And that was back when we were doing it more manually. We did do a bunch of this. I mean, look, I, I, re- I, mean, I had stacks of 10Ks in my office, you know, I chest believe high. It. I believe uh, it. And, and so did all of our team. And, and, but you're right. You know, you're right. A self-directed investor, you know, I think a big part of success in this world is to understand your limitations. And, and you should totally dig in. You should read the case. You should understand that stuff. And, and that's the only way to, to, I think, invest with a good conscience or with appropriate amount of, of risk management. Before we wrap things up, are there anything um, – I mean, you've already been very gracious as far as laying out your model and how you guys approach uh, investing for your firm. Uh, are there any other like pieces of wisdom or advice that you would share with people doing this at home that you haven't already passed on to us yet? Yeah, I, I think that we need to look at corporate governance more and more these days because if, if you look at the root of some of these big blow-ups like Valiant – the issue is not just that they're reporting pro forma numbers, pro forma the da. It's that executives are getting paid based on that, and or they're getting paid just based on stock. And so, you know, the, if they're getting paid just based on stock, then they are incentivized to see short-term stock pops, and they can do whatever they can to juice numbers to appease the market, see the stock pop, cash out for a couple hundred million bucks, and then they're good, right? They're good for the rest of their life. It doesn't matter what happens to the stock, right? Right. Um, if they're getting paid based on pro forma numbers, that's a bad thing because you can grow pro forma earnings while destroying shareholder value. So if you see that executive compensation is, is aligned with, with pro forma, that's a big red flag. And, and to, to really help investors with this, we created a model portfolio where we only, that only includes stocks that get our attractive or very attractive rating, which means they've got good quality of earnings and, and low expectations embedded in the stock prices or good valuation, and who also have management teams whose executive compensation, whose compensation is tied to return on invested capital. So when you can overlay you know, a, a, a profitable business with a, with a cheap valuation and executive compensation tied to return on invested capital, to me, that's the best risk management ever because you know the executives are paid to do what's good for shareholders. If executives are paid to do things that are not good for shareholders, like grow non-GAAP earnings, EBITDA or non-GAAP net income, whatever, then as good as things may be in the short term, they're probably going to be pretty bad in the long term because at the end of the day, the executive is going to do what butters his bread and that gets him paid. You know, I really appreciate that answer. I I interview a lot of people on this show, and the issue of management comes up a lot because it's important and it should. And you know, some and so often when I ask or the issue comes up, people don't really have a good response. And that's not being critical of other people, but it's like, well, you know, you can't. It's hard to be able to gauge management. It's hard to be able to know what their intentions are. It's hard to be able to know competency and stuff. And and that's all true, you know, because you can't get on the phone. You know, Tim Cook still will not return my phone calls. I can't figure out what the problem is. Um, <laughs> you know, right. I mean, so it's like you, you, you don't have that kind of accessibility. So, but that doesn't mean it's a completely blank slate or black room, whatever you want to call it. Your response is the first time I've heard someone talk about or that I can rem- remember someone talking about a very tangible, measurable thing you can look at to at least get an idea of whether or not management is someone you'd want to be aligned alongside of. Thank you for sharing that. That's very, very helpful. I'm glad to do it, Brian. I mean, it absolutely makes a lot of sense, right? I mean, people take for granted. I mean, the, fundamentally, the integrity of the capital markets rests on the assumption that the agents of capital or management have the best interests of the owners of capital in mind. And this is why people, you know, firms like Enron and Tyco and Valiant, this is why they are allowed, this is why they end up blowing shareholders up is because it's implicitly assumed that they're acting on the best interest of shareholders. But look, in this world, buyer beware, you can't assume anything. Right. So you, you need to go do your diligence and make sure that they're not getting paid to boost numbers that are going to boost their paychecks while you know hurting shareholder value. And we've got on our site, we've written articles you know, on some just 
absurd situations where executives did things that were really bad for shareholders and got big bonuses because right. they're misaligned incentives. And, and it's, it's, it's true. And I'm, yeah, I'm, I appreciate the kind words you have to say about that. And because at the end of the day, I think, you know, look, it's, it's in all of our best interest that our capital markets are efficient and that we're, we're helping capital realize its highest and best use. And to the extent we can help each other figure out how to do that best, you know, we make the world a better place. One last follow-up question. You know, so on y'all's model, you know, you're looking at value, future valuation and consensus expectations for cash flow and, you know, current prices. So do you guys, and so, you know, you'll potentially short companies that are overpriced and buy ones that are underpriced. Do you, as far as time frame, I guess you just hold those until things balance out and, you, and there's no longer an arbitrage advantage. Is that is it as simple as that? Yeah, I, I mean, you know, in today's world, stocks jump around a whole lot more than they used to. So, you know, holding periods are a little bit lower. Sure. But yeah, I mean, it's hard to predict exactly. I get that all the time. I do, I do a, a show with a with a market watch columnist, uh, and it's called Danger Zone. You know, so every every week we talk about something that you know to warn investors about. And he always asks me, well, "When's it going to happen?" You know, and if I could predict <laughs> exactly when market expectations were going to reconcile. You know, we'd be doing this call from you know my island in, in the Pacific or whatever. Let's right? be on, let's be honest, uh, David. We wouldn't be doing this call. <laughs> <laughs> but I appreciate uh, you it, thinking it, of me it, that way. Yeah, you know, it's it's a hard thing to do. I mean, and I think the best investors can hope for is to is to best manage their risk. And the best manager risk is to make sure you're in stocks that are profitable and whose prices reflect lower cash flows in the future than what you think is going to happen. Hmm. That's the best way to manage risk reward. That's what we focus on in terms of our ratings. Very attractive, attractive, neutral, dangerous, and very dangerous. Dangerous stocks are companies whose earnings are misleading. Their cash flows are lower than their earnings, way lower, and their valuations imply drastically higher future cash flows. The risk reward is really bad. Not only are they not that profitable, but the stock price implies they're going to be super profitable compared to the past. And even if you believe that's the case, there's almost no upside because all the good stuff about the future is already priced in. So right. again, it's, it's about risk reward, right? In a world where we can't, we don't know everything, we can't know everything, the best we can do is manage the risk of what we're doing. Try to mitigate the risk. Sure. Well, David, I could, I could um, pepper you with questions for the rest of the day because I'm fascinated about what you guys are doing. But I know I want to honor your time. But hey, thank you so much for coming on the show with us today. It's been a pleasure. And um, yeah, I hope you have a great rest of the afternoon. Thanks very much. I, I enjoyed it. And I'd be happy to do it again anytime, Brian. Awesome. Thank you. Well, I hope you enjoyed the interview with David Trainer. Remember, you can always get full show notes with links and other details at investinthefamily.com. And if you want to receive the purchase filter that I mentioned at the beginning of the show, simply text the word filter to the number 44222 or visit investinthefamily.com and get signed up there. We'll make sure to get you set up. And don't forget to visit am, uh, investinthefamily.com slash Amazon instead of Amazon next time so you can get your full and normal Amazon experience, but also get a percentage of your purchase going to us and invest in the family. This is Brian, and thanks for joining the family. The information and opinions contained on this podcast are for educational purposes only. The information does not consider the economic status or risk profile of any specific person. The information and opinions expressed should not be construed as investment trading advice and does not constitute an offer or an invitation to make an offer to buy and sell securities. 